So uh, my first question goes to, to Adrian, because uh, I guess we just listened to your really amazing paper. But then I would also like Sean and Julia to give their opinion, because maybe this question can be applied to your practices too. So Adrian, you said you have no self-interest in writing this paper. So I was actually very curious to know, why did you feel the need of giving us such advice? Well, number one, I really love giving people free advice. So, so that's the first thing. And I was invited to, to give a paper on this topic and loving to give free advice on any topic, I of course accepted the invitation. Um, but, but now I guess you know, the serious answer to your question is that um, you know, I take this distinction between artistic language and conventional language very seriously. The artistic language is the language that I personally develop in my artwork and that every artist develops in her or his artwork. And that language is idiosyncratic, it's unique, it speaks to some people, it doesn't speak to a lot of people. Sometimes it takes centuries for it to speak to people and that's just part of producing art. You just, you just have to live with that. The great thing about conventional language is that it is based on a shared set of criteria for meaning and reference. And so it enables people who may have virtually nothing else in common to communicate at a very basic level about issues ranging from the basic to the complex. And I think that really has to be preserved and protected. So any time I find a term which has loaded political and social content being appropriated into another context in which it is made to do double duty bringing the validation of the original context into a new context that is seeking validation, I get really nervous because I feel that the, the main point and the value and the purpose of conventional language is being violated. And that's the way I felt when I first started hearing about artistic research. I, of course, understand completely that there are economic imperatives in the background of this development, and I take those very seriously. But I think that if artistic research is to achieve the kind of validation that it's seeking, it needs to follow a procedure that respects the requirements of ordinary communication. And it needs to use the concept of artistic research in a way which enables the artistic researchers to be intelligible to academic administrators, to um, granting fund panels, to foundations, to governments. And as soon as language starts getting this fuzzy, blurry, uh, you know, sort of ambiguous use, which of course we can all do, you know, we can all do that anytime we like, it becomes harder commu to communicate harder to convey the value of what it is you're trying to achieve, and therefore harder to get things done, like get money. So that's, that's, what, really, that's what really got under my skin. Sean, can you, can you also maybe explain about your own motivations? <laughs> um, I guess maybe to... Yeah, um, I'll, I'll do my best. Um, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I'm afraid that uh, my natural mode is kind of fuzzy. <laughs> so, no, 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 just wait. <laughs> just wait until I answer this question, <laughs> and you'll see how fuzzy I can get. Um, but, um, I mean, I think, 
I also felt uncomfortable when I first learned of artistic research, particularly within kind of a university context. And yet I found myself in a kind of art practice PhD. And so um, I feel at some level like maybe I ought to explain myself. Or, um, because I, in, in, a, in one way, I, I don't see it um, I don't see it purely as a way to justify myself to administrators in order to get money. Certainly, I'm there because I have a scholarship from the state of Australia. So, you know, the, these sorts of considerations are a part of it. But I think that there is even a question as to, like, some methodo methodologies that might be sort of native to art. And so it doesn't need to look across to other fields to find more established ones. But then the question is, you know, what might those be? And, um, and especially because there's the kind of contradiction between the rigor of the other fields and, I mean, I think your paper sort of illustrated it so beautifully. Um, but one thing that it made me think of was in my, in my research in particular, I'm looking at the history of the essay form, for instance, which over its 500 years, and particularly in the, in the last century with the uh, uh, like Lukács and Dor uh, Adorno writing on it, um, and even prior to that, Walter Pater, um, this idea that it's something that's uh, methodically unmethodical or systematically unsystematic, you know, so this kind of uh, form that's already kind of embracing the contradiction between um, accepting sort of external constraints and developing an internal logic. Uh, to me, it seemed like, oh, maybe, maybe this, is a this is a conversation that didn't just start in the last 15, 20 years around artistic research, but it's been you know, going on much longer with regards to s systematic thought. Um. Yeah, well, it's hard for me. I think I need to quote here from this, like, I feel bad, <laughs> actually, because for me, it's difficult um, to uh, understand from which position I should be talking now, the head of education of the document S13, who is excessively argued for and against all those things, <laughs> or um, like my own training, who's, um, uh, I, did a, I did a dissertation on institutional critique that I couldn't get done in any art historical department in Germany, so I did it at the Art Academy in Vienna. And at that time, a professor was just implementing a PhD um, program there so it's like a lot of um, it's a lot of different <laughs> contexts for me going on here maybe um, like to to be you know most bluntly I'd say I feel like in my work and personally also no pity for the uh, institution of uh, language to be violated and that comes from like the um, the kind of sort wave institutional critique um, work I've been um, studying and, and supporting is um, that, that I believe really that the grammar is like a it's, a, it's a fundamental disciplinary mechanism that I, you know, that I think is important to unpack, not only in idiosyncratic ways, or like the poetry or the fuzziness that you um, uh, have, have uh, uh, you know, excellently, of course, outlined its limitations, but I believe um, yeah, of course you need, you know, all the funding, um, and, and I'm not saying like any research or anything can, can be done without money whatsoever, that would be uh, utterly naive, but I believe if that, um, that um, aim of, of uh, ordinary communication, as you said, or like any kind of normative uh, administrative policy um, would be the motivation of artistic research, I, I wouldn't want to do it, I guess. <laughs> That's my, that's just like my response. Now, I was wondering, um, in Switzerland we have various examples now in the last 10 years maybe of uh, experiences made between uh, science and art uh, to invite artists in residencies, for example, in, um, in the science department of uh, the University of Geneva or at the CERN in uh, Geneva also, etc. with always very, I would say, good results, whatever that means. I mean, people are very enthusiastic about it on both sides, either the artist and the, the, the people 
the scientists that kind of discover art and new ways of seeing their own work. It, it's this kind of thinking that uh, that is being more and more common, a good way maybe to address your conclusions that you had uh, in your talk, and also the idea of trans... Oh, you said your first point was to say, uh, be also interested in the other disciplines. And um, yeah, well, this is kind of my question. No, I just, I, I just want to say that th this is really wonderful to hear. It's really wonderful because my, my experience among my colleagues in the art world, you know, my circle of artist friends, e everyone's fascinated with science, really just fascinated and wanting to know more about it and wanting to find out how scientists think. And, you know, and scientists, you know, particularly scientists who are involved in serious original research, they love talking with artists. They really, really enjoy it. So I think there's a potential for great synergy, to use a corporate term, um, that really has not yet been fully explored. Could it also be applied? Do you want to say something? Yeah, yeah just as a, a small follow-up, but um, at the University of Melbourne, I'm involved in a, um, uh, with, it's called Bio 21, it's sort of the, the center for free radicals, and this is free radical chemistry, which is a sort of lone uh, electron uh, that, you know, with oxygen, and it makes, a, it has to do with the background behind aging and materials sort of decomposing and things like that. So it's, um, uh, that's the background, but the, I suppose that one of the most interesting parts about being involved in this is uh, one time where we all met uh, just to, to see the other people's faces and we went on having a discussion for an hour or two about um, our place in the university, uh, sort of like what we were expected to do and like how we found money within our particular departments. You know, they're just really practical kind of questions. It wasn't, it wasn't sort of like, um, yeah, it was very mundane. It was sort of about like how we, as occupants of a university, as employees, you know, with particular practices that are very specific and very different, yeah, us as artists and them as scientists, uh, but uh, to actually n no longer um, be sort of imagining what the other one is acting like, because we do in the arts tend to kind of, I think, be really reductive uh, when we imagine how other disciplines function. And, and vice versa. So. Yeah, actually, I, then that just makes me want to to connect to what um, Julia Moritz was um, talking about this morning, and you know your work at the Kunsthalle Zurich. Uh, Julia was uh, was talking about the younger reading group, which is uh, which is a reading group taking place every Sunday, um, in parallel to an exhibition by. Pauline Baudry and Renate Lorenz, please correct me if I'm missing something. And I thought there was, a, I, I saw some interesting parallel here because actually they are very often bringing highly academic text, but they, they manage to take it out of this academic context in order to shed a new light on them, right? And I guess that in, because we're speaking about education and um, programming within institution, I thought there was actually an you know, a very interesting way to revive feminist discourse within the institution, but at the same time connect to the exhibition that was taking place at this time. And, um, well, that was actually just a comment, but I'm sure you have something to say about that. That's actually making it even more complicated for me because I just decided to take on a little bit of the document ahead, but I can, of course, try to speak for the council too. No, I was just... Um, I, I just thought maybe in, in order to, uh, it's hard to get it out of you, but to a little bit contextualize this, the statement B and uh, the fascination with uh, art and science that we, that we know so much from, that was actually, I mean, really among the greatest experiences ever for me in, in art institutional work is that, um, of course, like this statement uh, you chose is a, is a newsletter announcement, right? It's not a, it's not a definitionary, um, at least not even you know anything towards that it's more uh, just putting forward like a focus you know that, that just the responsibility document has to say like okay now after five years we're going to focus on this 
And what we did in a, in a little notebook by Chus Martinez, who was the co-director, we all had this absurdist title, head of department, was the title. <laughs> so um, she made a little notebook in a series of the 100 notebooks on that notion of artistic research, where she puts forward, and that actually relates to a lot of what you said, like the um, Diogenes the theater, and to skepticism particularly, which was, um, you know, going back to when academia was just a place where people walked, you know, and look at um, uh, sexist empiricism, in particular certain uh, skepticist methods of doubt and like um, questioning and inquiring, uh, which which I think is an important motivation or like an important, um, if only a footnote to, to understand um, that how we use the notion of artistic research and what she concluded with, and whenever I relate to, to the work there, and particularly the theory and programs uh, that we did in conjunction with it, is the it's actually more like simply just thinking about the search. I mean, the search as such, I mean, it wouldn't be anything like you argued for that would, you know, valorize or itemize um, artistic in particular, again, that's, that's more like the, the common denominator of like really searching towards something but not just once, but like re-search it. Like not, you know, being confident or or satisfied by the existing knowledge to be acquainted or collected, but to kind of redo it in a way. So that was something, um, I think just for like the general, maybe not methodology, because I'm always also more interested in method than the ology <laughs> to it, but the, for, for that project. and. And of course, um, this is related to the young Norwegian group because that's where I come from. That was my last job. That's what I'm interested in. I'm, I'm super uh, excited to see younger and younger and younger people doing it differently also. And um, what I try to also um, uh, communicate non-verbally a little bit in the um, in the readings this morning, which of course were verbal, was the little, you know, how, how insecure you sometimes are reading things loud and, and how this these words on the page, the text, and your utterance of it, what, what it does to it, and, and how this is a way of understanding. But it's maybe a little bit before, beyond, I don't know, but elsewhere. <laughs> I guess, sorry, that was a long uh, well, okay. <laughs> Yesterday, Adrian Piper had some very interesting question for the panelists. Do you have some question for the to, to this morning's um, presentations? Yeah, I think um, maybe because today's presentations were closer to my presentation, I, I, I need more time to absorb what was done, but maybe they'll show up later. Of, uh, also students and people involved in the, oh, and yeah, priority to, to yesterday's panelists, of course. Roja has a question, and then we'll open to the audience. Yeah, so uh, thank you for all your presentations. Um, there's a lot to absorb, so I think, I hopefully my question doesn't sound too naive. Um, but I, I'm wondering where, if, if both Sean and Adrian, you guys can talk a little bit about how you conceptualize the difference between artistic research and artistic production. Um, in, in my mind, the idea of research, um, research in the sciences is the work itself. Whereas research, um, in the way that I'm sort of hearing, is somehow a preparation for a work. Is that is that am I characterizing that correctly? Um, and the other th thing that I'm wondering too, as um, is in what point in in the way that you're describing artistic research in your part four, does the idea of audience come in um, into the picture? Um, and for Julia, I wanted to hear more about. Um, you spoke about the, the over affirmation of a, pr of a problem in order to um, 
account for that problem or reach a, a kind of solution, a temporary solution for that problem? How does that work? Um, yeah, those are my questions. Thank you. Well, I, I, I finished my education before artistic research came along. So this, this is going to be an armchair answer rather than a hands-on involved answer. Um, one, one thing that happened for me as the result of getting seriously interested in philosophy and deciding to go back to school and study it was that it really freed up my artwork to not be th theory laden, the artwork itself. The work that I did before that was very involved with issues of space and time and perception and the relation between subject and object and the nature of the present moment. And when I look back on that work now, I, I see it using traditional philosophical concepts in, in really, you know, a, a pretty interesting way, but also really crazy, really, really crazy. You know, very idiosyncratic. And the process for me of doing that work was exciting because it opened my mind. You know, I just started reading a lot of philosophy and thinking about it and thinking about my situation. And I suppose, retrospectively, you could call that a process of artistic research. But at the time, it was just part of my creative process. That's the way I thought about it. When I started studying philosophy systematically, I allocated a space in my life towards that activity of opening my mind through reading philosophy. And that freed up my work to be completely intuitive. You know, so, so I, don't, you know, I don't do any kind of um, complex intellection or, or complex conceptualization when I do my work. The work comes up in my mind I figure out what's going on, whether I want to realize it or not, how I want to realize it, and I, then I just do it. And it usually takes me about five to 10 years to figure out what it all means for me. I think I better stop here. Mm -hmm. well, uh, what I do know about is the, um, that the artistic research within the university context being a kind of new, a new um, invention means that they're still kind of working out exactly what the difference is or what the relationship is between research and production and that there's no uh, consensus, I guess, among the different um, uh, places that actually have arts PhDs, like, which aren't all that many in the scheme of things. And I just m made a quick list as to what they are. And so when you said, uh, does the research come before the production? Well, that m might be something like within research-based um, arts practices, or let's say that there's a process of research that then uh, maybe leads to the production of something. But then within the, within the uh, literature of uh, like arts PhDs, there's these ideas of uh, practice-led research and practice-as research, which maybe then are like two other orientations. So if you think about practice-led research, that says that the production comes first, and then the uh, research maybe kind of happens right at the stopping point of that and on as a sort of process of reflection, maybe. And then, of course, all of them sort of assume a feedback loop where the, the research then informs the practice. And then the, the entire, um, I, sorry if this is like, boring I'm just like completely immersed in it because I have to I have to come to terms with it in order to like make my way through the through the institution but um, but it seems as though it's incumbent upon every researcher to 
sort of articulate exactly what that relationship is between the research and the production, and that it's not a given. It's, it's something that's sort of uh, articulated through every research project. Um, from the public program's point of view, of course, the research is always, <laughs> and uh, ideally, uh, uh, like I try to uh, allude to with like the cyclical search and research um, simultaneously all the time, like from, from my point of view. I mean, whether that be artistic or curatorial, that's uh, like another really complicated question, curatorial research. <laughs> we didn't talk about it yet, but it's a similar kind of, um, and I'm, I'm not also actually over invested in, into those definitionary things, but um, what uh, I think is is really, really important just to like a little bit to answer to, to that for me very much in, in the work and then come to, to the uh, Carson's question is that method and madness, which is that I found that so beautifully put and also that well, that was like a really moving part for me, you know, um, so so well um, articulated and I, it made me think of Arto, for example, like made me think of, I mean, even of course there's a lot of <laughs> madness, or, but I think um, um, I'm, I'm very um, skeptical always um, also about this distinction of, you know, the the free, mad, crazy, and and you know the research and investigation, and and I think this um, this idea of, of like the researching or like maybe it's a spiraling process or something, and in that sense I would hope because that was also very nice like the instigation and the exploration I hope it would spiral outwards then I guess from like the the madness as like personal uh, sickness or um, whatever. <laughs> So um, that just um, as an answer to the before and after, I guess. And um, yeah, the thing with the over-affirmation, it's something I think about uh, a lot recently, try also to do more systematic actually, because it, maybe that's the only thing where I would agree to be accelerationist or something. But I think particularly speaking about institutions, infrastructure, and I'm actually very happy to be at the Kunsthalle and have a platform from which I can host and you know redistribute resources, be it um, visibility or finances, and also at least you know try to have to try to establish some sort of a, a culture of generosity in, in public uh, discourse and debate, which you need you know some sort of a um, place to stand from. So I think. Um, the, the over-affirmation part is really when something is very much at stake for you. Like, in terms of the, the shifts of criticality that, you know, with the shifts of feminism, institutional take or conceptual art have, have, I think, made a turn in general towards a more embedded or implicated um, position to be able to speak from or to, to articulate your critical stance from. It absolutely matters. And Donna Hayward was super important for me in that to understand, like, if it doesn't, you know, you f even think you can withdraw yourself from that to a moment that there's no relationship between you and the object of critique anymore than why do it <laughs> anyway, or how even, you know, how can you then know what you talk about or what you critique or how it can even be better or imagine an alternative, I think is only possible then. But that was a little bit too general. What you mean is how does it actually work? And I think, um, I actually really believe in uh, a, a critique as um, imploding something also, like a, a deadly embrace. Like you hug something you hate so firmly, it just suffocates. <laughs> I think that's the answer. Hello, uh, sorry, this is another question for uh, Julia, um, so Elise kind of described the young girl reading group as um, like an examination or re-examination of um, f like feminist texts in a new or different context. And it's a really basic question, but I just wanted to know if you thought that the Tikkun book is a feminist text. So it's basically a yes or no <laughs> answer. Is, is theory of the young girl a feminist text? 
do you think? The first one. The, the yeah. The, yeah. That's hard for me to answer because I haven't been at those first conversations they had about, but if you ask me, myself, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I about oh, it. Well, I'd like to, uh, yeah, actually, I'd like to know your opinion and also yeah. I'd be intrigued to see what they made of that book as well. Yeah, no, that's, um, since I can, and <laughs> or refuse to access the Facebook and various documentations of the first conversations, it's just uh, via them talking to me now, two years later. So it's, it's gonna be a very um, fuzzy answer and also speaking for them. Of course, I felt um, even doing too much today. But um, for me, that book, The Theory of Preliminary Thought Younger was really important and empowering. I mean, I think in that sense, um, I would consider it a feminist book, particularly also because it's not reduced to biological gender, because it looks at this um, construction, right, of like a young girl as this kind of um, imperative to uh, consumerism, to, uh, you know, um, effective relationships, you know, all kinds of things. So um, I think as, um, as a critique of, of this, um, how would you call it, like, uh, and this, of course, not the right word, but the um, template, so to speak. Let's say post digitally, like the template for um, all kinds of relationships today, social relationships, and also, of course, um, depoliticization and, and all that comes along with it um, is, um, to my understanding, a relevant feminist point. And because it, it, it does so via, you know, kind of. Uh, this this uh, gendered um, can I not be a native speaker too <laughs> I would say um, protocols then yes like so it it activates certain gender protocols towards like a general exploitative um, situation to me so that's why I believe in it less and I agree and and support like uh, the development from the text in the reading group on towards, for example, which the thing that was most mind opening for me recently was reading Luis Igaray on this, because the text is from 77 and we read it and it was so utterly contemporary to us. So that was, that was as hard to explain what was, we were reading it like we were actually saying it. Also it's like a picture text, it's a, it's a different um, uh, genre, so to speak. But uh, reading Luis Guerre in the, um, the, like before the backdrop of the tikkun, for me, made um, terribly much sense, very much. I guess I, yeah, I, I found it a really problematic book, actually. Um, I didn't find it, I think, I didn't find the language, the, the, yeah, the use of the young girl as an analogy for basically like all the kind of uh, like as, as the last bastion of like the um, consumerism or whatever. I didn't, f I didn't find that useful and I, um, and I think, yeah, that the language can be quite violent in that way. Um, and I think, um, I think there were yeah, good points in it, but I don't, I didn't think it was a particularly feminist text. So, yeah, I just, yeah, that's not really a question, it's just a no, statement. I, I would totally agree to like the, the, the violence to it a little bit, or let's say it's more like a rhetorics of violence that you probably uh, me. But then again, look, um, in, the, in the show that we did with Renate and Pauline, we had a piece, uh, an homage to Valerie Solanas and the Scum Manifesto which I think n nobody would refuse to be a feminist text in some way, or whatever it is or not. But I think there's, um, there is, I, I understand, the, like, um, like an aggression and an anger to it. But f me personally, and like in my political motivation, I, I would subscribe to that rather than that. Thank you very much. Are there some more questions? Maybe. Federica Martini was a co-curator of the first edition of the symposium two years ago. Yeah. So, first of all, thanks to the three of you for these very generous and thought-provoking talks. And um, I think it's very interesting also to touch upon uh, the subjects of artistic research today also because we are 
Yeah, I mean, what I really appreciated in your talks is that uh, we really address some critical questions and we get away from the stereotype of artistic research self-reflection. Uh, of course, it's very important, I think, for any discipline to, to think about itself, but at the same time, uh, I think we, we, we've heard so many times titles such, such as those. Who's afraid of artistic research or what is art re artistic research doing without never addressing the issue of methodolo uh, methodology, for example. And I think um, this um, issue of cross-disciplinarity di cross is very important also for financial reasons. And I was very interested also in uh, um, listening to, uh, to Julia, uh, PhD, for example, like, like as an art historian uh, going to an art school. Uh, to do a PhD. So I think this uh, cross-disciplinarity when we talk about artistic research today is, uh, is happening in quite unexpected ways in a sense and uh, um, like we're increasingly trying to attract in our schools today also academicians coming for other contexts in order to develop these departments. And one of the questions I would have is uh, also going back to what uh, Sean was introducing this morning about creating cr uh, a platform for critical thinking outside institution. If there is a chance for artistic research to take place outside institution. Uh, yeah, I suppose, uh, gosh, how to answer? I mean, ob obviously that comes uh, along with giving up a number of things, like by being outside of an institution, you give up access to certain resources, you give up uh, maybe some form of wage, you give up access, yeah, again, to libraries resources, I suppose, uh, space for, for a peer group. Uh, but of course, you can reconstruct a lot of those, uh, a lot of those things. So those are, let's say, the, the infrastructures. Uh, you can reconstruct some of those. Um, but yeah, I suppose from, like a, from the point of view, from the perspective of methodologies, you're, you're sort of asking, like, can, can you create kind of uh, culture or space that allows, that will support the kind of what is artistic research? Is that the question or is like not? Yes, I think partly yes. Uh, one, one of the things that, uh, that kind of uh, emerged uh, implicitly is the relationship between uh, fundamental research and applied research. Like for when we had the Bologna uh, declaration coming over like here in Europe and giving this task of artistic research also to institutions that were not universities at the time. Uh, like uh, the idea was also that somehow if as an artist you want to be a researcher, you, ha you have to be within a specialized institution. And uh, of course this goes with the funding, but for example, when symposia are organized in artistic research, we had a recent experience here in Switzerland independent artists presenting themselves as researchers were not invited. Um, I was told to hold this closer to my mouth. <laughs> it's better. Uh, you know, as you were asking the follow-up question, I realized something, and it's uh, before I entered this PhD program, I never identified as a researcher and I, have no mo I would have no motivation to. <laughs> so I guess the question of like, is it possible outside? Well, maybe, but I would have no interest in doing it, come to think of it. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess in the, when you're asking the question, I realized actually how much I identify research with the institutional form of the university. Um, and that I didn't necessarily see the, the need to articulate the practice that I was uh, doing uh, as research prior to entering the university, but yeah, of course, I have to speak the language of the university in order to 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 be a part of it. Uh, and so now, research, research, research. <laughs> um, 
So I'm perhaps like not very well fit to answer the question, and I'll pass it. This, this is really a complicated question. <laughs> um, I, I'd like to answer it from the perspective of being an academic researcher in philosophy. And, and you know, th this goes along with my argument that research is just basically research no matter who does it. I, I can think of some situations in which it would be very difficult to do research if you were not in an institution. If you're doing basic science research and you need a laboratory and you need assistance and you need equipment, that would be very hard to manage if you didn't have institutional support. But there are other areas, and I would include philosophy in this, in which actually doing that research is very cheap. You know, if you have a laptop and a public library, you can, you can find the information you need. And you can write the papers, and you can read other people's papers, and you can, you can attend conferences. You can do those things, provided you have an independent financial form of support. Now, up to very recently, at least for artists of my generation, it was taken for granted that you would find a, a low-stress day job so that you could spend your main time producing your work. So at the moment in philosophy, it's really very, very difficult because there are lots of cutbacks, departments are being closed, positions are being cut, people are being let go, or they're being forced to work under horrible working conditions. And people are now starting to confront the question, you know, do, do I want this life badly enough to accept the daily humiliations of ha having to work under these conditions? And I feel, speaking now as an artist, as though I'm, I'm just shouting, shouting at people who can't hear me, get a day job. Go out and get a day job drive a cab, run an office, become a waitress. There are lots of things you can do that can support you financially while you do the research that you like to do. Now, this only works if you're really interested in that research. If it's simply that you want a job and the university won't give you one, then, then you know, this, this won't work. Um, but if you're really curious about the stuff you're researching, just take your laptop and go to the library. Sorry. <laughs> Other questions? <laughs> yeah. And then uh, you. No? Yeah, I guess uh, Adrian summarized in that research could be go in any region. Or research or field, but I mean, when I think of research, I, I look into the Defense Department. And uh, J.P. Guilford, he was a theorist to look into creativity and how you can educate creativity. I mean, it's a big philosophical question. And uh, he was uh, funded by the Defense Department in California. And I mean, during the times of conceptual art that happened in California and still arts, I mean, this is at this kind of a very parallel time, I guess. But, I mean, I don't have a day job. Um, I somehow was able to fund my research uh, through al alternative means by selling drawings or something. But, I mean, I guess the question is uh, about anthropology. And, and I mean, the, you talk about science and art, and, and this has a big backing by the Defense Department, too. In anthropology, when you are researching, I guess you run into the means of a cultural relativity or ethnocentricity, and uh, it's a subjective view. But I mean, uh, I wonder how you can overcome uh, getting grants and stuff when 
you're actually um, doing work uh, that is being suppressed, uh, suppressed histories. Uh, I mean, I talk maybe about oral histories or in terms of uh, the colonized people or things like this. Yeah. When, when, you, when you talk about work that's being suppressed, who, who is suppressing it? By the governments. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, in specific to uh, right now, uh, the Korean government in South Korea, the, uh, the woman president is actually uh, rewriting the textbooks about, and uh, is not talking about the coup d'etat that happened. And her, her father was a, the dictator for 18 years. And I mean, this is directly my research. And uh, I mean, I, in serious matters, I tried to get funding from institutions, but they reject uh, anything that is political. And it's not political, it's about uh, memory politics, huh? It's, it, it's very difficult for me to speak to this because mm. I don't know cultural anthropology as a field well enough to know what kind of funding you would need in order to do the oral histories that you that you need to do in order to pursue your work. Mm. So so this is a very superficial answer. Yeah. I guess it's not obvious to me why it would be impossible to simply live in the communities you need to live in in order to do the oral histories you need to do and collect the data you need to collect. And probably many of those communities would be less expensive to live in on a daily basis than, for example, you know, Los Angeles. Yeah, I mean, I, I went on, a, a, a f I did tons of field work in uh, Korea for three years, and I mean, uh, going through the archives of the institution and the uh, oral histories and whatnot, I mean, it's, I guess you could say it's quite difficult to, when you just, just think about the aspect of the archive and collecting data. Um, it's fairly easy if you just have a computer and you have uh, some knowledge and you can investigate into very tangible forms, but, uh, after production, where is it? Where does this uh, become either exhibited, turned into an exhibition? Does it turn into publication or film? I mean, there's many different types of outlets for research, and I guess that that could be the question too. I mean, what is the final product, or what? It, how does it become synthesized or refined, and get out and reach out to the public? Is it a symposium? Is it a lecture? Is it a book or just a website or? I don't know. Well, I'll just share my experience of, of what I did after getting kicked out of the field of philosophy. Oh, okay. nice. <laughs> um, um, you know, of course, I, I continued to, to know the people I knew before I got kicked out. And uh, as it happened, I got kicked out the same year that I, I finished this huge manuscript in philosophy that I'd been working on for a really long time. Um, now, in that field, if you have a website or a Facebook page and you can make your texts into PDF documents, then all you need is a little business card that you carry around with you to every professional conference you go to. And when you get into conversations with people about your work, you just give them the card. They go to the website, they download the work, and then you engage in conversation with them. It's cheap. <laughs> it's effective, yeah. All right. Okay, not, not so much to speak about this, but um, the funny thing is that um, my dissertation on the institution week had a case study of uh, ETA in the Basque country, and I got a grant for, weirdly enough, from there, like the Basque Ministry of Culture, to research that, which was. I think not exactly as difficult for the as your situation, but like similarly kind of complicated, like who you're accountable to, what can you do, how can you then speak to the people you want to speak to if you come with that context or money. And um, over affirmation doesn't work there, I realized, but um, opacity is something I learned from the people I talked to uh, there, like in the field of like institutional critique as like institution 
in general, not like art organization, right, but like broader uh, institutional fights. And I mean, I've confessed uh, already that I'm not a pacifist, but I think um, there are strategies in uh, that context of, you know, spaces of conflict um, like um, camouflage and or that can be subsumed under tactics of opacity that would enable you, I believe, or I found it convincing in that context to place criticism uh, in ways that are not equally legible to anybody. I mean, it's, it's this question also of, you know, the literacy of the, the signs or whatever you're going to use. Yeah. And I uh, can say that also to com uh, coming from the GDR and, and having grown up there with musician and activist uh, parents who, you, who did the same. So I think um, it's, a, it's a question of uh, how much, uh, how explicit you want to give away your critique or how sustainable or like infiltrated or what you actually want to achieve, right? If you want to protest, of course, then that's a different thing, but can, I think, you know, subcutaneously achieve things with a little bit of a mimicry moment. Thank you. I think there was a hand over there. I just have a very fast question for uh, Adrian, uh, because we have you here and uh, I want to ask more like a personal question maybe. So I, I was asking myself all the time, why is such a, a artist who started with, with conceptual art and also kind of um, connections to uh, LSD movement, uh, counterculture and all this, uh, also you did work on yoga, um, how such a person then is not mentioning when, when she is doing philosophy people like Lewis or Gattari or like other people like Brian Masumi or Erin Manning, but instead is referring to Kant and Hegel and it's, it's like a diag diagonal. So like if you would have been doing like very minimal art or you know like very clean art, then maybe it would be a direct connection to Kant somehow, I would imagine, but you made like a diagonal so maybe you can comment on that or is it, I suppose it's more productive than to do this. this thank, kind of thank you Shintaro Miyazaki who was also a panelist yesterday. Actually I did do minimal art for quite a while. I, I, I produced a lot of work before I then moved to thinking about words and pieces of paper as themselves objects. So, so, so I, did, I, I did go, in fact, uh, that, that standard route. But the thing to say is that at the time that I got interested in philosophy in the 60s, at that time, everyone was interested in analytic philosophy, everyone. Jasper Johns was reading Wittgenstein, so of course everyone had to read Wittgenstein. The, the art language group was reading Austin and Ryle and Quine. You know, analytic philosophy was the area of philosophy that was the focus of attention. The, the, well, at that point, it, it hadn't emerged. Continental philosophy was basically 19th century philosophy, which is, you know, which comes from Kant. My personal route into philosophy, you know, what, what really got me going with it was writing an essay on space and time as forms of perception for a catalog and having a friend of mine who was a philosophy major tell me that I needed to read Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, and particularly the, the Transcendental Aesthetic, and reading that part of the text and thinking, oh, well, Kant and I are talking the, about the same thing. And so, you know, Kant was the, the direct source. I, I, I think you can, you, can, you can jump into the water at any point.
okay. okay, thanks uh, to everybody for the presentations. And I have a question for Adrian Piper. So, um, yeah, thanks for your four very insightful distinctions. And, and I was wondering if I understood you well that you see these four points as possible definitions and that finally that the fourth definition of artistic research as research would be a synthesis or like a conclusive statement that involves or integrates knowledge and investigation and exploration. And if this is a final or like at least working hypothesis of what how you could define artistic research, could you then just explore a little bit this? And because I'm wondering, um, particularly to this aspect, if it's a defining um, investigation, um, I, I'm interested in, in it because I'm working in the field of art and history of science. And while working in history of science, when I work on scientists, on some particular scientists, I realize that I do rather history of research because if you do history on medical science or psychotherapy or psychiatrist, you're not dealing exclusively with science because a psychiatrist or a medical doctor qualifies its work in relation to patients. And so research is really at the center of this practice. So my question is more, is um, your way to be informed in definitions of artistic practice, may this have an impact also on other disciplines such as history of science or where if you go deeper into practice you realize that you cannot use the same categories anymore. What, what I wanted to say was that yes it is true that artistic research includes all of these different modes of inquiry but so do other fields and I wanted to conclude that although there are many situations in which it makes sense for artists to do research, there is no particular mode that is exclusively artistic research. If they're doing research, then they're exploring, they're investigating, they're analyzing, they're questioning, they're solving problems. They're doing all the things in the particular order and the particular way they need to do them that people in other fields are doing in different ways, with different training, different procedures, different methodologies. But, but the components of information gathering and the ways in which curiosity is expressed really cannot be codified in terms of different fields. That, that, that was the main thing that I wanted to say. 